Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming all the way to Fukuoka to join G20 OECD seminar on corporate governance. My name is Takuji Yokoyama of Japan's Financial Services Agency. I will act as MC today. To start the conference, Deputy Prime Minister Aso will deliver the welcoming remarks on behalf of Japan. Deputy Prime Minister Aso is on the way. Let's welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank, thank you very much, and sorry, 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 kept you waiting. Uh, two years ago, uh, we co-hosted the OECD Asian Roundtable on, on the corporate governance in Tokyo. This time, in the context of the Japan's G20 presidency, we are very pleased to welcome you to Fukuoka, where happened to be my hometown. Actually, very close to here, not exactly Fukuoka city, but a more civilized city called Izuka. That is, <laughs> I, I was born. <laughs> Since ancient times, Fukuoka has uh, prospered as an important hub for Asian trade. Today, the, Fukuoka is a vibrant city with a higher level of the new startup in Japan. As the birthplace of many new companies, I believe Fukuoka is well suited for today's discussion, which will have a particular focus on the challenge faced by startup. We are delighted to co-host this seminar with OECD. We welcome OECD Secretary General Angel Guria-san for, uh, for his remarks. We are also happy around the globe and the implication for corporate 
uh, corporate governance. Well, leaders endorsed the G20 OECD principle of corporate governance in 2015. This seminar marks the first opportunity under the auspice of the G20 to discuss its implementation. The, princip the principle of supposed, supposed <coughs> supported the dissemination of good governance practice. They have been widely used as a global standard for corporate governance by national regulators, international organization, and the standard setting bodies. Let me briefly talk about the corporate governance reform in Japan. As you know, the Abenomics has focused on revitalizing the Japanese economy and achieving the virtuous economic cycle. Corporate governance reform is a key element of Abenomics strategy. We brought in the stewardship code in 2014 and the Corporate Governance Code in 2015. We have continued to review and update these codes. The two codes have successfully transformed the behavior of both investors and investees firm. 248 institutional investors, including all the major ones in Japan, have adopted a stewardship code. We have witnessed a sharp increase in the number of the independent directors sitting on board boards. Now more than 90% of the companies listed in the first section of the Tokyo Stock Exchange have more than two independent directors. This is up to just 20% in 2014. The OECD principle have been a good reference point for our reforms. Improving corporate governance is, however, a never-ending process. Companies need to continuity adjust and update governance practice inside our rapidly evolving economics and market environmentals. environment. We should help the corporate accelerate their effort to meet this end, one effective approach is, is to further promote a constructive dialogue between investors and investee firms. This can contribute to improve the governance and encourage corporate executives to take informed decision and to act decisively. It will help lay the foundation for longer-term increase in the corporate values. More broadly, it will support the sustainable economic growth. Japanese companies hold cash and deposit among the staggering 240 trillion yen or 2.2 trillion dollars, US dollars on their balance sheet. You mean cash? More than 50% are cash. That what is a fact. This is equivalent to the almost half of the Japanese GDP. Further improvement to cooperate the governance could put this cash into actions. Whether this cash could be used for boosting innovation through research and development, or higher wages to attract top talent. The upside to the Japanese economy could be enormous. We are therefore fully committed to further advancing corporate governance reform. Let me now turn to, to the caching nature of, of the ch uh, changing, na changing nature of capital market across the world. More companies are choosing to be acquired rather than going public through the initial public offering or IPO. 
Fewer IPOs and ongoing distinct, distinct have uh, resulted in a declining number of the listed companies in some advanced economies. This may shrink the boundaries of corporate governance via capital market and lessen the opportunity for public shareholders to benefit from the company's growth. Also, passive investment, which follows the benchmark indices, has grown relative to active investment. Passive investors may, use, may need to place a greater importance on engagement with the investee firms as they have no choice but to hold the shares included in, in the benchmarks. In light of these developments, the future landscape of corporate governance could look significantly different from what we see today. In conclusion, I am confident, <coughs> confident that by building on today's discussion, we could gain new ideas and deeper insight for better corporate governance. This discussion would help us to support the longer-term rise in the corporate values as well as wider, wider social sharing of its benefits through better corporate governance. Thank you very much for your participation, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Prime Minister Aso. Next, Mr. Angel Gurria, the Secretary General of the OECD, will deliver his opening remarks. Let's welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> Dear uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Dear ministers, governors, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to co-host this important seminar with the government of Japan. And I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to our Japanese colleagues for the successful initiative. In an increasingly globalized world, an orderly integration of our capital markets is crucial to strengthen the global economy. Today, one-third of the world's 80 trillion in public equity investments take place across borders. This provides companies with opportunities to seek finance from a much larger pool of investors, generating higher productivity, creating jobs around the world. However, an enhanced integration of capital markets also increases the interdependence between investors and corporations from countries with different legal, regulatory, economic, and cultural traditions. That's why the G20 OECD principles are so important in providing a common global language and a standard of corporate governance thereby also promoting higher regulatory convergence. Now, I have here the um, corporate governance principles, G20 OECD, and I hope that this Japanese version says exactly the same. <laughs> and of course, uh, also the corporate governance fact book, which I will refer to in a minute, so I, 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 get, I get a bonus, you see, every time I wave one of these publications, so please bear with me. Now, the principles help policymakers improve the legal, regulatory, and institutional framework for good corporate governance. They provide guidance for stock exchanges, investors, and corporations. They support companies in attracting 
long-term patient capital, critical to ensure their development over time as investors develop increasing confidence in their performance and integrity. The principles are more needed than ever. Disputes around remuneration, repeated corporate scandals continue to haunt us, reflecting lack of oversight, poor transparency, weak accountability. Business investment growth is still modest. It's actually well below pre-crisis levels, moving towards a mere one and three quarters percent per year in 2019 and 2020. We're talking about half of the speed of 2016, 17, 18, which was already below the levels of investment growth in the years before that. And of course, what changed in the world was these trade tensions, because you basically invest in order to produce, in order to sell. If you do not know if you can sell or at what tariff you're going to be able to sell or whether you're going to have a tariff that is too high in order to have access to a market, then what happens is you hold back on your investments. And if millions of people do that at the same time because of the uncertainty, then what happens is you have a very fast drop in the expected rate of growth. And even consumption is held back. And consumption, of course, is the growth of today, and investment is the growth of tomorrow. So this is why we have shaved off around 1% of the growth, the expected growth in the world economy in 2019 and in 2020, vis-a-vis -vis what we were expecting only about um, one year ago. Now, in this context of a slowing down of investment flows, and uh, which is characterized by a growing mistrust of the people vis-a-vis -vis markets, people getting very cynical about the markets, and they're very cynical about the corporate world, the principles are a key tool to advance good corporate governance, enhancing the much-needed trust by investors and by the consumers in terms of how transparent and about the integrity of the companies involved. This is why the OECD has made sure the principles are put to active use. As promised when the G20 leaders endorsed them in 2015 under the Turkish presidency. In collaboration with the World Bank, we issued a methodology to assess implementation. And the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, has taken stock of how member jurisdictions have applied the principles to publicly listed, regulated financial institutions. Our Corporate Governance Committee has carried out thematic peer reviews, and through our regional policy hubs, we have enhanced and engaged our contacts with countries in Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, North Africa, to ensure that corporate governance policies don't become ends in themselves, but rather effective means to stimulate investment and business dynamics. Now, the 29 edition of the corporate governance uh, fact book, the one I just uh, showed you, and that we are presenting today here in Fukuoka, shows the progress that has resulted from these efforts in 49 jurisdictions. It includes all OECD, G20, and FSB countries, and it outlines the challenges ahead. Now, since the G20 OECD principles were endorsed in 2015 in, in Antalya, 
during the G20. More than 80% of the 49 tracked jurisdictions have amended either their company law or, or sometimes and or, their securities regulation. And nearly half of all jurisdictions have revised their national corporate governance codes in the past two years. And 83% of them follow a, quote, comply or explain compliance practice. A growing percentage of jurisdictions, more than two thirds, now issue national reports on company implementation of corporate govern governance codes. It used to be slightly above 50%. We're now at two thirds. So clearly, a lot of progress has been made on this front. Our reforms have been particularly dynamic with respect to risk management and remuneration, two areas where weaknesses significantly contributed to the global financial crisis. And remember, we're still suffering the consequences. Low growth, high unemployment, growing inequalities, and a very serious drop or destruction of trust in all the institutions we have built over the last 100 years, all with the consequences of the gravest, greatest economic crisis in our lifetimes. And we're still reeling from those consequences. And we're still trying to get back the trust. We're still trying to recover the trust. And clearly, you are a very important part of that effort. Now, for example, measures regarding the separation of the board chair and the CEO, well, they have doubled in the last four years. They are now in place in 70% of the jurisdictions. In 30% of the jurisdictions, the separation is now a binding requirement because in 70% they are practiced, but they're not necessarily binding. In 30% already they are binding, and that is growing. More than 80% of jurisdictions recommend nomination and remuneration committees to be established and are actually are establishing them. However, despite this progress, much remains to be done for example, regarding the very top level of the companies. Even though an increasing number of, country, of countries are promoting balanced, diverse composition of boards, the infamous glass ceiling in corporate leadership is still pretty thick. Women comprise at least one third of senior management positions, 39% of the 49 jurisdictions covered show that women have slightly under 40% of the senior management positions. But only 10% of such jurisdictions have women comprising at least one third of the listed company boards. Now out of the 49 jurisdictions covered, 21 of them have less than 15% of women on boards. So we need much more women in top positions to further advance in management quality and enhance the performance of corporations. If we go to uh, check the numbers in terms of uh, women CEOs and you know, women uh, chairs, etc., the numbers can get pretty thin very fast. So dear friends, to conclude, I want to highlight that gathering all this information, you know, bringing up these numbers in this effort, the Corporate Governance Factbook for 2019, this is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, well, it's a Herculean task, actually. It takes a big team, a lot of work, many, many months of 
work every time we put this publication out. And uh, I have to say that the consequences or the results of putting out this information have been very, very important. And that our experience, every time we get a meeting of specialists that have to do with corporate governance, they j just tell us again and again how important it is to have this comparative information. Everybody in each jurisdiction, in each country, knows about their own country. What this helps is to put this together and then to have the processing of the numbers, the, the actual churning and, and, uh, of, of, of the numbers, and then making the comparative tables and then the comparative analyses. And that is when, well, you look at yourself in the mirror, naked preferably, huh? and then you see, well, do you like what you see? Huh? Because what we do is we accompany that not only with a picture of yourself, but also yourself compared with the rest and in terms of the performance. Now, let me also say thank you to um, the government of Japan, to the OECD Corporate Governance Committee, but also to its chair, Masato Kanda. Let's keep working together to strengthen corporate governance, present and future OECD work on how digitalization can enhance transparency, efficiency, and trust in markets will help underpin these efforts. This is the, what I call the bright side of the digitalization. Count on the OECD to advance our collective initiatives for a multilateralism that delivers. We are counting on you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Secretary General of OECD, Korea. Now, we would like to move on to session one. The topic is implementation of the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance. Let me introduce the chair, presenter, and panelist. The chair is Mr. Masamichi Kono. The presenter is Mr. Matt Isaacson. The panelists are Mr. Dietrich Domanski, Mr. Marcelo Santos Barbosa, Ms. Maria Patricia Grieco, Mr. Toshitake Inoue, and Mr. Heath Tabert. Now we are ready for session one. Mr. Kono, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. So um, a warm welcome to you uh, to this panel discussion, uh, which uh, promises to be extremely interesting because we really have a great panel. And um, I hope to uh, hear um, a lot of um, their experiences and their insights um, in the uh, perhaps a uh, little less than an hour uh, uh, that is allowed for this session. Now, um, well, it was mentioned in the introductory remarks by uh, Mr. Asso and Mr. Greer that um, uh, we really um, uh, would benefit from reviewing the experiences and insights gained in the implementation of the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance across countries um, make comparisons, look at the mirror, and see uh, where we are. But I would also like to have this uh, discussion a bit um, forward-looking in the sense that um, uh, we now have those facts about uh, what um, has been happening, what progress we've made. But let us also think about the future, uh, what kind of reforms uh, uh, we would need, and, uh, of course, uh, to deal with uh, new challenges and opportunities. Because... Um, I, I always uh, think of um, this thing as, um, or the corporate governance uh, principles as um, requiring, uh, um, let's say, maintenance or ongoing um, work to keep uh, them 
um, evergreen. Uh, because circumstances change, uh, country um, differences um, exist, and uh, of course um, there are new developments, uh, particularly uh, at this point in time, digitalization is uh, one uh, uh, element which is transforming our economies and societies, and uh, certainly corporate governance um, uh, will also be affected. Uh, I mean, there are, of course, the risks, but also um, great opportunities to use those technologies. Um, I would also like to, of course, uh, put in a certain element uh, of um, uh, what may be broadly called sustainability, because um, we have been certainly um, working towards having uh, corporate governance evolve in such a manner as to um, integrate ESG factors or at least um, um, make um, corporate behavior consistent with um, our efforts towards uh, uh, sustainable growth. And uh, we also uh, want um, um, uh, those firms to apply the highest standards of uh, responsible business conduct. And uh, the OECD has been um, uh, developing uh, uh, due diligence guidance and uh, guidelines concerning RBC, uh, responsible business conduct, and um, uh, certainly uh, this uh, still requires uh, uh, more dissemination, more effort in countries to uh, implement. Um, so, um, without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce the panelists, and I will keep my introduction short, but later on I would like to uh, pose you, um, to each of you uh, some uh, specific questions. Um, to my left is um, uh, actually our expert at uh, the OECD Secretariat, uh, um, Mr. Mats Isaksen, head of the Corporate Governance and uh, Corporate Finance Division at the OECD, with a long and extensive experience in supporting policymakers uh, ac across uh, not just OECD members but non-OECD members or countries. Um, then um, to his le uh, left is uh, Mr. Dietrich Domanski, Secretary General of the uh, Financial Stability Board. As you know, of course, the FSB has been instrumental in leading the, um, the work uh, to uh, um, um, uh, design and then implement um, uh, reforms uh, uh, post-crisis, and of course with uh, the objective of um, uh, ensuring financial stability and integrity. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, they have also been working on this aspect of corporate governance uh, for uh, those financial institutions that matter. And um, now uh, to um, his left uh, is, uh, I, I mean, to, to from, your, for, from your side, it's actually to, your, uh, uh, to his right, excuse me, uh, Dr. Heath Tabert, um, Acting Under Secretary for uh, International Affairs of the U.S. Treasury. Um, actually, he has uh, multiple hats. Uh, he's uh, G20 finance chair at the uh, G20 finance ministers and central bank governance meetings. Um, also, uh, the great news is that he has just been confirmed as um, the incoming uh, chair of the uh, CFTC, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, an important uh, market regulator in the United States. Congratulations. Um, and uh, we would like to learn from you uh, what um, you have been working on at the, uh, in the United States and uh, your uh, future work. <laughs> um, then um, Mr. Marcelo Barbosa, Chairman of the Brazilian Securities and Exchange Commission, CVM. And um, you have been uh, a Financial Stability Board member. Uh, you have also been an OSCO Board member. And I understand you have written many articles on corporate law and securities markets in your uh, previous career. So um, uh, we would like to learn from your insights. Uh, then Mr. Toshitake Inoue, uh, Director of the Corporate Accounting and Disclosure Division of the uh, FSA Japan. Uh, you lead the division uh, which is in charge of corporate governance and uh, also uh, accounting issues. Uh, um, and um, actually, he's uh, an old colleague of mine, uh, and so I'm really glad that we can join uh, the same panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, so uh, we can certainly hear from him uh, the, the reforms that um, actually uh, uh, Minister Asso just uh, introduced. Um, then Ms. 
Patricia, uh, Maria Patricia Grieco, Chair of the uh, Board of Directors at Enel, the multinational and Italian energy company. Now, um, actually, um, the Enel Group, uh, I understand, uh, operates in more than 30 countries, so you, you certainly have the advantage of being able to compare across countries um, corporate governance frameworks and practice, and so we would certainly like to learn from you, uh, from your experiences. And um, you have also been chairing the Italian Corporate Governance Committee, so um, uh, what so, um, you have been doing under this title and uh, what are the uh, challenges for your country, uh, certainly uh, we would like to hear from you. So. Um, uh, again, uh, in the interest of time, um, uh, I would stop here and um, immediately turn uh, the, uh, uh, or give the floor to uh, Matt Isaacson um, to kick off uh, the discussion. This is on. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kono, uh, and good day, everybody. Uh, in, the, um, in the publication that uh, Secretary General Gurria uh, showed to you, um, and that is available to you, we have actually in inserted a report on the very theme of this session, on the implementation uh, of the principles. So I will not go through that in detail. Um, I will just point to a few things. Uh, and what one of the things that you will notice in that report is that it will it has a, it, it's, it's not only used by the OECD, it's also used by other international organizations such as the Financial Stability Board and the World Bank. Uh, in terms of the OECD, one of our core uh, tools for implementation uh, are our so-called thematic peer reviews, which we do with all our member countries once a year. Last year we did on flexibility and proportionality, and next year you can look forward to a report on the uh, responsibilities of boards in groups uh, of companies. And I should also say, while the principles are primarily directed to policymakers and regulators, we also see that they are actively used uh, by a lot of business uh, organizations and other stakeholders around the world. I would like to say a few things why I believe that the uh, principles have become so useful and why they have become so widely accepted. And I think that it is because the OECD committee, which was the standard setting body, they, they allowed a great time before they put pen to paper to get the facts right. They wanted to know about the reality in which the principles were supposed to be implemented. And they also wanted to make the link between finance and the real economy in order to help create economic growth, like our Secretary General referred to. So before the committee even put pen to paper, they asked for several empirical and analytical reports from us in the Secretariat. They asked about developments with respect to intermediaries and institutional investors. They asked about what does the stock market infrastructure look today and what are the developments in terms of business models in the stock exchange market? What are the current ownership structure developments? And what is the company's use of market-based finance? They asked about uh, growth company use of, of market-based finance. And they also asked us about bondholders and the bondholder rights developments. And this they allowed us to do in peace and quiet before they started to actually develop the principles themselves. So I think that we are very fortunate in the respect that the principles is not a, what I would say, the, is, not a, is not a cocktail of opinions. Uh, they are derived from uh, uh, an understanding uh, of modern capital markets, and I think that is very much what makes them useful. And this approach will also be an important part of going forward when we support the implementation of the principles, because our understanding is that if you don't know the dynamics of markets, 
we will never be able to provide good advice with respect to how to use the principles. And rules needs to be adapted all the time to reality. And reality is constantly changing. So the fact that the G20 and the OECD foresaw this close link between capital market developments, the need to support corporate investment and corporate governance, how the three actually hang together, it is a bit unique in what I sometimes call the echo chamber of corporate governance discussions. But it is also, I believe, an important reason for the success of the principles. And this is also a perspective that we, together with all our partners, will maintain when we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mats, for that overview. So, um, with this um, scene setting, um, can I now turn to Dietrich? Um, uh, the work at the FSB has already been referred to, but um, what really uh, is going on now, and um, uh, how are you, in a way, using those principles? Th Please. Thank you, Massa, and thank you for inviting me to speak today, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, Massa and Mats have already referred to the FSB's work, and what I would like to do as uh, a means of introduction is to provide a brief, brief overview of uh, what we have done in the, in the corporate governance space and how this work relates to the G20 OECD principles. Um, now, the origins of this work, unsurprisingly, and as in, in many other cases, um, uh, are, is, the, is the financial crisis, and here sort of two main areas of corporate governance issues. One is um, there were many examples of poor governance at the firms of the center of the crisis, poor governance leading to excessive risk taking, but also, and that's a second area, um, there were significant issues in terms of misconduct with benchmark setting in foreign exchange and, and in foreign exchange markets. So, and the misconduct in these markets was sufficiently severe and pervasive to threaten, to undermine activity in, in key global financial markets. Now, the corporate governance failings at financial institutions came in many different forms. A lack of challenge of senior executives by board members that themselves had insufficient experience, a lack of independence for risk functions, poorly aligned incentives, created by compensation frameworks with only upside for senior executives and employees taking actions which were clearly against the interests of their clients. Given the systemic nature of the inappropriate behavior, these issues were not only of interest to conduct regulators but also to prudential authorities. And in terms of responses, one angle was to strengthen governance frameworks the other to improve practices in financial institutions. And these two angles uh, were also reflected in the FSB's work. Now, in May 2015, the FSB launched its misconduct work plan. And the overall objectives of this work plan were first to reduce the opportunities for misconduct and second, at the same time, to strengthen the ability to contain associated risk. All this work was targeted both at authorities and, and the private sector. The work program was completed last year, and key outputs included a toolkit for firms and supervisors to tackle the causes and consequences of misconduct, the development of the FX Global Code by the Bank for International Settlements, and a toolkit to address misconduct in wholesale markets from the International Organization of securities commissions. The common theme of all these uh, outputs was a focus on improving corporate governance at financial institutions. And as such, these tools and guidance pretty much complement the OECD um, principles. Now, the second strand of FSB work pertinent to our discussion today is related to compensation practices. Work on compensation has been on the FSB's agenda for a decade now following the publication of the FSB's principles and standards on compensation in 2009. 
The principles and standards promote sound compensation practices and align compensation with prudent risk taking so that compensation actually provides the right incentives to maintain a healthy financial system. Through peer reviews, progress reports, and intense engagement with the industry, the FSB has continued to maintain a focus on, on this issue. And in the coming days, we will publish the latest of uh, uh, the progress reports on the implementation of the principles and standards. Um, the report highlights progress in the implementation of the reforms for significant banks, but also emphasizes the need for continued vigilance to ensure risk alignment. Now let me perhaps say at the end a few words about um, uh, the, um, um, the, the, the role of global standards um, in, in ensuring effective corporate governance. Um, such standards obviously provide a basis, an important basis for international consistency of corporate governance. And uh, the G20 OECD's principles have been des designated as one of the FSB's key standards for sound financial system. In addition, as already mentioned, the World Bank benchmarks member countries' corporate governance frameworks and company practices against the principles. Now, how well are we doing in, in implementing the, the principles in the financial sector. Um, Angel Gurria already referred to the uh, 2017 FSB peer review, which looked into the implementation of the principles. And um, on the positive side, the review found that uh, all FSB member jurisdictions do have a comprehensive government framework in place. Now, on the less positive side, uh, there, uh, the report finds that the effectiveness of this framework can be impacted if the division of responsibility among financial sector authorities is unclear or if the various requirements overlap, leave unwarranted gaps, or otherwise not well aligned with each other. So the peer review sets out a couple of recommendations on how to address these issues, and uh, we may come, come back to some of these, these later on. Um, to conclude, I think the main message is that robust minimum international standards have an important role to play in fostering better corporate governance in a comparable, consistent way. But in the end, it is the implementation of these standards at the level of individual jurisdictions that determines their effectiveness. And like in other areas of post-crisis reforms, this is, I think, where continued effort is needed. Thank you so much, Dietrich, and, and I hope uh, you, you will agree with me that um, we have made some progress um, uh, post-crisis, but um, of course, as you mentioned, uh, um, there is uh, still work to be done. Uh, but then uh, your focus is now increasingly implementation, also evaluation of uh, those reforms. And, um, but then um, I think um, now I uh, will turn to Heath, um, uh, you will uh, tell us that probably that is not enough to actually have a truly um, dynamic and um, uh, uh, effective or efficient um, uh, capital market, uh, and that uh, you've been working um, in the U.S. to actually review uh, existing rules and also practices, and how does corporate governance fit into that? Please. Sure. Well, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here today with all of you. Uh, grateful to the OECD for hosting the seminar and, of course, for Japan for hosting the G20 in this beautiful city. Uh, corporate governance is obviously a major pillar of the U.S. financial system. I mean, our, our view is that corporate governance is, is critical to ensuring uh, public uh, public confidence in our markets uh, as well as those of investors. And so, uh, w you know, we have high corporate governance standards that align with the OECD G20 standards. And one of our goals is to make sure that, that uh, as, as everyone else is saying, that internationally everyone sorts of adopts high governance standards. I am struck um, by the very first part of the very first principle of, of, of the corporate governance, which says the following. 
The corporate governance framework should be developed with a view to its impact on overall economic performance, market integrity, incentives it creates for market participants, and the promotion of transparent and well-functioning markets. And this is, of course, similar to what Secretary uh, General Gurria just said moments ago, which is that corporate governance standards are not an end in, them, in themselves, but the goal is economic growth and investment. And, and, and that mandate, I think, closely aligns with what the president did in, initially after coming into office, which is develop a set of core principles for the U.S. financial system. And the core principles were, were meant to improve the financial system to better serve the American economy, taxpayers, consumers, businesses, investors. Um, and it ultimately culminated in a set of core principles and an executive order which directed the Treasury Department, as you mentioned, to essentially study our regulatory framework um, with the basic premise that the idea is that financial authorities have, have a responsibility to periodically look back at regulations to determine whether they're appropriate, uh, they promote economic growth uh, effectively and efficiency. And in fact, the, the FSB is doing something very similar with its evaluation uh, work stream. Um, a couple of the reports are relevant. Most particular is our one on capital markets. And in writing that report, we, we noticed a couple of trends that we wanted to wrestle with. One of them was that there had been a 50% decrease in the last 20 years of the number of public companies in the United States. Now, the report, of course, acknowledges that private markets are important and private companies are important, but 20, a 50% decrease seemed quite striking, and we wanted to sort of get to the bottom of it. And we were concerned about, you know, potential regulatory burdens uh, that, that were creating this and whether or not uh, they could be addressed in a manner that strengthened our financial system or were consistent with corporate governance. Um, so a few of the capital markets regulation um, recommendations actually dovetail quite nicely with the principles. The first goal of our report was promoting access to capital for all types of companies, particularly small and growing businesses. Um, and I note that one of the things that the, the fifth OECD principle on transparency says essentially that there should be accurate disclosure on all material matters. And one of the things that we saw in our studies was that there was, there was the concern about information overload, that there were a lot of uh, requirements for disclosure that were non-material in nature. And so uh, one of the recommendations we had was to address that. A second goal of our financial uh, capital markets report was uh, fostering robust secondary markets in both equity and debt. And there I'm reminded of OECD principle, the part G of the third principle basically says that stock markets uh, should provide fair and efficient price discovery, and in so doing, actually reinforce corporate governance. And one of the things that we saw was that while large companies had access to various trading platforms, and they were traded on multiple areas and therefore had the market depth and liquidity, for smaller companies, uh, we found that um, th there wasn't a variety of exchanges and alternative trading platforms, and as a result, arguably, it could potentially have corporate governance ramifications. And then finally, a third uh, point that we, that we made in the capital markets report was the idea that we really want to level the playing field internationally. And there I'm reminded of uh, corporate governance principle six, which is directed at the board, uh, which Part C emphasizes that the board of directors uh, adopt the highest ethical standards, not necessarily legal standards, but ethical standards. And there, our capital markets report came firmly down on recommending that, among other things, uh, jurisdictions across the country, across the world, um, adopt the OECD principles on anti-bribery. And so those are just a few things uh, that we did uh, in looking at our financial capital markets. There are a lot more technical recommendations as well regarding derivatives and, and that thing. But a number of them do hit on corporate governance. Um, and, and again, the important point is that they're, they're fully consistent with the G20's principles. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Heath, uh, for your excellent remarks. And, uh, we are, of course, uh, very delighted that um, um, your uh, uh, course of reform, the, the, the whole um, report, I don't claim to have read all the, uh, the pages, but certainly um, 
very uh, useful um, and um, highly um, intensive discussion over uh, the cost of reform. Um, those are actually consistent with the G20 OECD principles. That is excellent news. But at the same time, of course, um, you've indicated some uh, areas in which uh, we need more action, and so we again appreciate that. Um, now, um, on that basis, um, um, I would like to now turn to uh, Marcello. And um, well, we've always thought, of course, that um, um, well, calling for a, a level playing field, um, we can't just um, apply uh, one size fits all. And so, for emerging market countries, for uh, um, large markets, um, small markets, um, there are some nuances or um, uh, differences that we uh, need uh, in order to cater to the specific circumstances of countries. And so um, in Brazil, uh, if I understand correctly, um, there have been some uh, reforms uh, um, conducted. Uh, now, how useful have um, those uh, G20 OECD uh, principles been um, in your efforts? Uh, and could you provide your, uh, your insights for my major emerging market economy? Thank you, Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm grateful for the invitation from the OECD and from the government of Japan, and congratulations on uh, an event that's so efficiently organized and everything going so well. I, I'm very sure that these will be days of very productive uh, interactions here. So um, let me pick up exactly on, on the concept of the emerging market that you just described, Massa. And uh, why is it especially important for us that there are, um, there are all these efforts on creating principles and establishing levels of convergence? Well, internally, uh, for any type of uh, emerging economy. Not, it doesn't need to be a large one, a large econ uh, emerging economy like ours, but for any type of emerging economy, it's good to see how you are doing so that you can ob obviously know which direction you need to go. But it's also good to remember that capital markets are out there competing. And a set, uh, uh, a work, an excellent work, by the way, such as the OECD Factbook that Secretary General Gurria just uh, uh, presented, that helps us to help us to go out and showcase our strengths as well. Each market has a number of features in which we do particularly well, and in some others, we go back and uh, at home and we see what we can do best to, to improve. And this is uh, where I want to, to pick up. Um, we need to, redu to eliminate questions of uncertainty in emerging markets. Global investors, when they look at an emerging market, they try to interpret, not only to read the law, but to interpret how the authorities will respond to that, how fast is a, a judicial claim, how fast is an administrative claim, how predictable is a decision from a court or from, say, a securities regulator. So again, the, the more work we do on that, the more we align to the internationally established principles, the better response, the better indication we can give to global investors. Um, having said that, I wanted to mention a few uh, recent developments in, in, um, in Brazil in that area. And the first of them is um, <clears throat> the introduction and the improvement of distance voting mechanisms in Brazilian uh, uh, listed companies. Distance voting was introduced in 2015 and has been picking up year after year after year. Nowadays, two thirds of the companies listed in the Brazilian stock exchange, B3, have received votes from this source. Virtually all shareholders who use this facility are non-residents, 98.2 to be sure. The vast majority of them are based in the United States. The number of companies 
for which distance voting was mandatory since 2017, shows that the percentage of minority shareholders using it is increasing steadily. And this is very welcome, because if we add a more active participation by shareholders in the, in the government uh, mechanisms that we have, we can reach for other goals such as um, a more diverse representation at the board level, a more efficient means of, account of enforcing accountability at the companies, and so on and so forth. This is a, virtual, uh, a virtuous uh, uh, circle that's very positive for the market as a whole. So, but anyway, each annual shareholders meeting season, when it's ended, we have discussions with B3 in the stock exchange and the market with a view to assessing the results of this mechanism and fixing the problems that are identified. Also, since 2017, the Brazilian Code of Corporate Governance has been incorporated within the disclosure statements of Brazilian companies. In practice, it's a new annex to, this, to the disclosure statement that has been created, and companies have to inform their adoption or not of a number of practices. It follows the basic form of comply or explain approach, and it was based on the code of corporate governance that was agreed among 11 market entities, representing all the market segments that we have there. And the CVM participated in this long discussion, and believe me, it was very long, <laughs> uh, but we were just observers. Uh, in the end, we were satisfied with the result and incorporated it within our uh, uh, official documents. So now, um, the companies, uh, obviously we don't judge the substance of the responses, but we judge the completeness and the accuracy. That's a very important instrument of transparency, and because it's still so recent, we are on the second uh, of, uh, year of full implementation. We still have uh, uh, a lot of exercise to do, a lot of review and, uh, and analysis to do. Um, it's also uh, worth mentioning the 2016 Statute on Governance of State-Owned Companies, which applies to all listed companies as well. Brazil has had a number of uh, uh, issues in the recent past involving state-owned companies. The statute was a congressional response, a very firm response on that, and then uh, so that now we have strong uh, requirements and prohibitions uh, regarding el eligibility of members of, uh, of, pardon me, senior officers of state-owned listed companies and of directors of those companies as well. And we've had the chance to apply uh, uh, that uh, new statute on, on five occasions uh, at the CVM. And on the five occasions, we decided in favor of the minority shareholder that was claiming the indication made by the state that was the, that was the controlling shareholder. In only one case, there was a judicial challenge, which is still going on. So, um, there's another initiative I'd like to mention in the end, but I, I'm, I'm sure that when we get to, to the questions, I'll have time to do that. And I'm finishing exactly on the seven minutes that were granted to me initially. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, uh, an extensive um, introduction of your reforms. But actually, I was um, very much intrigued by what you uh, mentioned um, as the process of actually developing those uh, statutes and um, uh, new um, rules because, I mean, this, of course, demonstrates that uh, we need really um, an intensive um, dialogue between uh, the markets and uh, the, the regulator or the, uh, the amongst the st stakeholders and that um, um, you need this um, process uh, uh, transparent and also um, uh, extensive uh, in order to arrive at the, the right um, answer uh, for uh, any of those issues. So uh, thank you for that. And um, that would probably seamlessly uh, lead to uh, uh, something that we would like to hear from uh, Toshitake uh, because in Japan also uh, there have been those developments uh, of um, developing a stewardship code, the stewardship code, then the uh, corporate governance code. And there again, uh, you've taken a um, uh, n n not just a comply or explain approach, but also a, uh, a process that um, is really based on dialogue with uh, stakeholders. So um, could you please? 
th thank you very much for your kind introduction, Kono-san, whom I respect so much. Uh, I'm, I'm very thrilled to be able to work with you on the same panel again. And uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, all the distinguished guest speakers uh, who come all around the world. My role here is to briefly explain about uh, the process of corporate governance reform in Japan, as well as its outcome and the issues for further progress. As uh, you listened to uh, Mr. Kono, uh, Mr. Aso's uh, introduction, introductory remarks, uh, we have promoted corporate governance reform in Japan as a part of a growth strategy in the economics policy. The stewardship court and the corporate governance court are working in tandem through constructive dialogue between investors and companies, aiming for sustainable increase of corporate value and realization of virtuous cycle of the economy. The corporate governance code was first uh, formulated in 2015 uh, based on our policy that the code be in accordance with the OECD corporate governance principles. And uh, Mr. Matsi Saxon, um, he had kindly given advice at the council meeting in formulating our code. The establishment of the two cores uh, in Japan maybe a small step for the mankind, but it was a giant leap for the Japanese corporate governance reform. We established the Council of Experts for the follow-up of the Stewardship Court and the Corporate Governance Court, consisting of members from corporations, investors, and scholars, and, and it monitored the implementation of both cores. As Minister Aso said, the, the companies at Tokyo Stock Exchange in its first section with two or more independent directors increased from 21.5% in 2014 to 91.3% in 2018. And the companies with more than one-third independent directors increased from 6.54% to 33.6% during the same period. You may have heard that uh, Chairman Nakanishi of Keidanben, or Japan Business Federation, uh, which is a business organization consisting of major Japanese companies, talked at its recent seminar to the members' companies that the corporate governance reform should now be implemented by the initiatives of the top management of the companies rather than by the government. Thus, uh, you see that the mindset of corporate management is changing drastically to respond positively to the corporate governance reform. As Masa just said, that the stewardship code was introduced in, in Japan in 2014, and the number of signatory has now increased from 127 at its outset to 248. Overseas institutional investors represent 46% of all the signatories, and the code is widely accepted by global investors which is somewhat unique compared with the stewardship code of other countries. Although um, we see the progress that I mentioned, some people point out that the compliance to the cause remained formalistic. In order to respond to these voices, we revised the stewardship code in 2017 and the corporate governance code in 2018. The Forum co Council of the two cores also released the opinion statement regarding recommended directions for further promotion of corporate governance reform last April, just one month ago. The opinion statement covers recommended directions for further revising the stewardship code on the current pending issues. I would like this to four of them. Uh, the first, the enhancement of information disclosure or explanation by asset managers. The second one is, to, uh, to, is a promotion of stewardship activities of corporate pension funds. Three, uh, improvement of processes of uh, proxy advisors and improvement of opinion exchange with companies. And four, improvement of conflicts of in interest management of investment consultants. The opinion statement pointed out uh, uh, two pending issues for corporate governance. Uh, the one, uh, reporting of the internal audit depart department directly to audit committees and outside directors. Two, uh, group governance issues from the standpoint of protecting general shareholders' interests. 
that uh, the opinion statement is uh, just a five-page document. Um, if you're interested in that document, uh, uh, we have put several copies at, uh, at the, the entrance table. So um, please uh, pick up and uh, take a look at uh, Kohi Blake. That would be uh, very interesting. Now I turn to uh, the Asian countries. In recent years, Asian countries have actively implemented various corporate governance reforms. The corporate governance course has been widely introduced in many Asian countries. But as for the stewardship code, Japan introduced it for the first time in Asia in February 2014. And it was followed by many Asian countries and jurisdictions, including Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea, and Thailand. Although the code uh, in each country and the environment of listed com companies are different, it is considered that a no loose norm across the country is being formed. We expect that the accumulation and sharing of know-how and closer communications will be prompted under the framework of OECD corporate governance code by each level of regulators, companies, uh, and investors in Asian countries. As uh, verified in Asian countries, we see the benefits of having internationally uniform corporate governance uh, principles in the following aspect. From investors' viewpoint, enhancement of corporate governance companies around the world will reduce risk of investment and thus diversification effect will be expected. From developing countries' viewpoint, improvement of productivity and risk management is, is expected through enhancement of corporate governance. From the regulatory viewpoint, it contributes to stabilizing financial systems and coping with emerging global issues such as environment and society. Lastly, I just would like to let you know that this year, the annual conference of International uh, Corporate Governance Network will be, will be held in Tokyo from July 16 to 18. And I hope that you may also uh, be able to participate in this event. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Toshi, for um, reporting on progress in Japan. and. Um, well, in fact, I do remember um, as many years back, um, uh, we were very mindful of um, the, 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 the areas in which we needed to make progress in order to be in conformity with the G20 OECD principles. Now, um, I think uh, you've made a lot of progress. So uh, thank you so much for that. And also, uh, thank you for referring to uh, our Asian partners. Uh, I mean, there, of course, uh, we need to have um, consistency and uh, commonalities. Um, so, uh, Maria, Patricia, um, uh, may I turn to you? And uh, it may be a bit unfair to um, have you as uh, uh, representing the, 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 the entire global private sector, <laughs> but uh, you certainly have a lot of experience in this area, and you're leading, of course, uh, the Italian uh, Corporate Governance Committee. So, please, uh, can I yeah, hear from you? It seems that, uh, thank you for your invitation, it seems that I'm the only one representing uh, the private sector. But since I do believe uh, that uh, we can have in the future a sustainable world only, uh, only through a strong, a strong cooperation between public uh, institution, uh, international organization, and private sector, so I will try to convey to you my view as to the role of the private sector. Uh, there is a long way to go, uh, but by adopting uh, an integrated division, let me say, of the three ESG factors, uh, I guess that uh, is, uh, this is the basis for every action that companies, institutions, and international organizations can really adopt to try to reshape the world in, a, if I may, more sustainable way. And, and the governance is a key word when we talk about sustainability. I, I read what, what OECD principles say about governance, that is to help build an environment of trust, transparency, accountability, necessary for fostering a long-term investor, investment, financial stability, business integrity, thereby supporting a stronger growth and more inclusive society. And I would underline the word inclusive because, I mean, ESG as an S 
in the, medium, in the middle, that, that means a society. We all have to take care about what does it mean society in the medium long term. And so we all have, let me say, tried to imagine a new business model for the world. And so I do believe that corporate have to play, have to play their role. If I look at uh, our European uh, corporate governance, uh, uh, I would say that we made uh, good progress. We had a few months ago uh, a meeting uh, with the chairpersons uh, of the six major European uh, corporate governance committee in Europe, and we all decided uh, together that uh, uh, we should have revised uh, our code in the sense of strengthening the ESG principle and uh, to focus the code much more on the sustainability, which, uh, by the way, is also requested by our, by our investors. Uh, uh, and so uh, we are working in this respect, uh, and as far as they the Italian uh, code is concerned, again, we will focus uh, mainly on uh, sustainability, on the monitor monitoring of risk, which is a critical part of sustainability, on the responsibility of uh, uh, the board, and uh, on, uh, I mean, again, the key factors uh, that can help the board of directors to monitor, uh, which are the key uh, the key uh, facts in order to have a long, medium, long-term sustainable uh, growth. In our Italian code, uh, we have already introduced the modification as far as uh, the gender uh, uh, the gender principle is concerned, uh, and uh, removing, uh, let me say, an expiration date that was uh, foreseen by the date by, by the law. Sorry, we have removed the expiration date, so it's a stable principle, the one uh, through which, in the Italian listed companies, at least one third has to be represented by. Uh, the female gender, because uh, uh, because it's the less represented uh, gender, in generally speaking. Uh, then, uh, I mean, I would like uh, to to just uh, make a mention uh, to what we have done at ANEL uh, level. Uh, so now I am speaking about my company, uh, in order to try to have uh, a better, if I may, uh, environment. Uh, uh, allowing ANEL to work uh, with uh, its uh, participated companies because we have around 800 companies in the world, uh, subsidiaries of ANEL, but we have also out of which 15 are listed companies in different countries of the world. So you can imagine how difficult uh, uh, may be to, uh, is uh, to manage a conflict of interest and related party transactions in 15 different uh, jurisdictions without uh, having uh, at the low level, uh, the concept of group, because uh, almost nobody jurisdiction recognizes uh, the interest of the group. And so we tried to, let me say, not to avoid, but to try to have a better understanding with, uh, with our subsidiaries as uh, to what does really mean to belong to a group without interfering with the loyalty that each director has to bring to its own, to the company that he represents. And so we had a very, a very complex but very interesting bottom-up approach, and uh, together with the, the, the general counsel of the headquarter, together with the general counsel of, of the various countries, with many academics, at the end they worked out a kind of procedure, uh, saying in a very simple way, in, in, from one side, which is the interest of the group, and the other side, which is the loyalty that every director, again, has to bring to its own company. And, uh, and uh, this procedure was presented in Madrid uh, one year ago, together with many academics uh, which approved, who approved uh, this uh, procedure, and now it's uh, something that we implement uh, at, our company, at our company level. And uh, in a few words, uh, again, uh, uh, the, the, the the meaning of this procedure is uh, the fact that uh, each listed company has to safeguard its own interest uh, and the interest of the minority shareholders, but that at the same time, there is the interest at the corporate level by the fact of belonging to an industrial partner. So in other words, uh, there is a value in uh, bringing the knowledge uh, for the renewables uh, 
to any subsidiary in the world without interfering with the, the specific interest of the subsidiary itself and without, uh, again, uh, interfering or, I mean, uh, having, viol uh, having any violation of the interest of the minority shareholders. So this is something we are very proud of, and it's, uh, uh, again, uh, um, what the companies can do also in term at the private level in terms of best practices. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Patricia, and thank you for raising the ESG issue, because long-term sustainability of business is indeed part of uh, our uh, corporate governance principles. I'm told that the time is already up. I actually had <laughs> a second round or third round even of the discussions uh, prepared, but um, if there is a pressing question, I would like to take just one question from the floor. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask a, a pressing question? No? Can I turn to the panelists? Uh, will, will you, uh, would you like to say um, maybe in 10 seconds each um, um, some of your aspirations, what government should be doing, what um, are, uh, will uh, uh, keep you awake at night um, for the next uh, uh, year? Uh, yes, Marcello. Hello. Yes, just just real quick, something extremely important that we have been doing, and it has to do with um, strengthening enforcement of minority shareholders' rights in Brazil. And I've um, I wanted to touch on this because it's a work we've been doing together with the with the OECD, and that has already added. Uh, significant value to our framework. This is a, a, a joint work that we have been doing with the Brazilian Ministry of Economy, and then it led to an uh, issues report that was the object of a workshop last year with a number of specialists from academia, private sector, public sector. And now, uh, after the discussions in that workshop, um, the, the final report and the action plan, they are pointing in a number of important direction for important developments in strengthening the, the rights of minority shareholders. So this is something that we can never lose sight. Uh, it, it needs to be added to diversity, transparency, ESG factors, but we need to go again to whoever is fueling those companies, and those are, in, in, those are the shareholders indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, something that we should discuss at the Corporate Governance Committee. Um, Heath, can I have a, f a last word from you? <laughs> I have to say that I completely agree, and the oh, procedure yes. that I mentioned before was uh, uh, really in the light also of safeguarding uh, the interest of the minority shareholders, uh, uh, who have a, major a majority shareholders uh, who is also, I mean, in the industrial partner, so they may there may arise some doubt. Not, we don't want doubt. We want to, to really act in a very transparent way so that we can safeguard also the interest of the minority shareholders. Surely, transparency will be a guiding principle. Heath? No, only that uh, I do think it's important that we continue to work on these, and we have high levels of corporate governance throughout the world. It is very important to our capital markets, to public confidence. Um, and, and to economic growth. Thank you. Um, Dietrich, you have something? Uh, just one observation, picking up on something that uh, others have observed, the importance of stakeholder dialogue, um, including at the international level. I think this is absolutely critical. It is critical, not least, to counter the two main challenges with respect to governance frameworks implementation going forward. One is, I think, amnesia, that we forget the cr lessons of the crisis. The other is fossilization, that we sort of fail to adapt frameworks in light of a changing environment. Digitalization is obviously key here. So I think close interaction dialogue between official and private sector is, is key in that regard. Thank you so much. So we don't want dinosaurs in the room. Um, Toshi? Well, I just would like to once again this, uh, to stress the importance of constructive engagement with investors and corporations are, is a key to advance the corporate governance reform, uh, not in Japan, but elsewhere in the world. And I think uh, ICGN annual conference in Tokyo will be a good opportunity to further discuss that point. Thank you. Surely, we appreciate that. 
So, um, thank you so much. Um, if there are no other uh, pressing comments, um, let, let me um, close this session. Uh, I, I won't try to wrap up uh, the discussion. This has been excellent, and uh, hopefully you have your own takeaways about uh, uh, your way forward. Um, thanks to the great panel. Uh, can we give a big hand of applause? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So now we are running short of time. So let us move on to the next session very shortly.